I have joining me today Dr. and Rabbi Marvin Antelman. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Thank you very much for having me here. So we're going to find out today, who are these, people's, these people behind the scenes who are possibly infiltrating uh, our organizations, the, uh, the Jewish people, our media, our education, uh, all sorts of spheres of life. Who are these people? Who can we trust? And where do you fit in in this devious agenda for control in the world? So, Rabbi Antelman, you were telling me before we started the show that this happens to be the time of the 250-year anniversary of the Council of Four Lands. In Hebrew, you say that as... But I borrowed so I actually it's the two hundred and fiftieth anniversary of a special Khairum, which was the next communication in the ban that they issued. And it's very, very pertinent to, to us today. And I'll try to bring the connection. First of all, let me say this. There are a lot of conspiracy theories out there. I'm not interested in theories. I'm interested in facts. So the scholarship over the years that I've utilized are sources that are impeccable. For example, Anthony Sutton, professor at Stanford University, wrote two books. Uh, he wrote more than two books, but two books which are relevant to what I'm going to speak about. One of his books was Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, and Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. There he goes through a lot of trouble to document the connection between the leaders of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is an acronym also for Carnegie, Ford, and Rockefeller, who, hmm. who provided the, the main funding for this. Interesting. And he's a professor with impeccable credentials. And then there's, there is the late Professor Carol Quigley, who was professor of political science at Georgetown University. Matter of fact, he was even quoted when Clinton became president in his inaugural address, he, he quoted Quigley as one of his people that he had, he had studied under. So Quigley was very well known. The CFR loved him, and he decided that he would do a very nice thing. He would reciprocate the love and put out a book called Tragedy and Hope. But when it came out and, and it spoke so much about the CFR activities that they didn't want people to know about, they turned against him. And he himself then reassessed his position with them and wrote a book called The Anglo-American Establishment, where he claimed that a handful of people were running the world. And those two books are impeccable as source material, but there's other impeccable source material, and that is the scholarly works that were put out by professors at Hebrew University to deal with what we call the Sabadian Conspiracy, which I'll go to in one moment in our history. L let me preface those remarks by saying that as every Jew well knows, right out of the Haggadah, and every generation, they're out to destroy us, and every generation has its killers and persecutors of the Jews. In the 17th century, it was Chimonitsky who headed the Cossacks, who was out to destroy Jews and did terrible atrocities killing hundreds of thousands of Jews in Poland. The atrocities were terrible, and to commemorate this terrible series of events, the Jews kept a fast day, the 20th day of Sivan, to commemorate this, which was this past Friday, commemorates the Chimelnitsky massacres. Today, it's no longer an active fast day, but it was observed for, for a few hundred years. In any event, on the 20th day of Sivan every year, the Vat Arbor Rotsat, which is a council for lands, which is the biggest tribunal of its kind at that time, met once a year on this day and took up questions of Jewish law and other things. So these were very big rabbis, leaders of the community, who were on this Council of, of the Four Lands. The Council of Four Lands was backed up by the no less than the King of Poland. <clears throat> it began in 1520 and lasted till 1764. It consisted of 30 rabbis, <clears throat> 30 rabbis, 15 of who were lay leaders and were rabbis, and the others were not lay leaders, they were full-time rabbis. They were dealing with a problem that was a byproduct of the Chimelnitsky massacres. What happened was when the Jews were 
were massacred like that, there was people were speaking again about redemption. We were looking around for redemption. And all of a sudden, a man by the name of Shabbatai Tzvi, who was born in 1626 and died in 1676, came along and said, I am the Messiah. And he had a tremendous following. When it was realized that his following was so great and there would be problems, the sultan, because Shabtai Tzvi was from Izmir, came along and gave Shabtai a choice. Either you die or convert to Islam. So he converted. Now, there were about a million followers prior to the conversion. When the conversion happened, then there was disillusionment among the Jews. But there were some diehard people who who set up different cults of Shabtai Tzvi. And the, the worst one of them was called the Dome, which was a secret organization. And the Dome was based in in Turkey and in Salonika. And the Dome gave rise to these terrible orgies that went on, which became part of the immorality theology of Shabtai Tzvi corrupted later on. He apostatized himself. Ten years before his death, so when he died in 1676, he had these these cults doing all kinds of evil. And the reason that these these uh, followers of Shabtai Tzvi were doing evil was because what? Here's the thing: the Talmud says that the Messiah would come when everybody's good or everybody's bad. There is such a th saying in the Talmud. So they, the Sabadians said like this, it's impossible for everybody to be good, it's easy to be bad. So they turned around the Torah and they said, if you do an evil deed, then you will use up the energy of the, of the universe and it will collapse and you will force Messiah to come because you will have used up all the evil in the world. So whenever they, they engage in an orgy, they would make a bracha, and every day they would figure out a way to, to do as many sins as possible. Like if you eat chalev, you're chayef karet. In other words, if you eat fat, according to the Torah, you're to be excommunicated from your people. So they would eat fat. It was prohibited, non-kosher fat, from a kosher animal, which is chalev. Which, which is in that category, like eating blood from a from a So they would animal. Dafka do the opposite. They do the opposite <clears throat> in order to hasten the the, the coming, coming of, of the Messiah, Messiah, which is totally ludicrous. These these sound like people who were who are today fodder for all these Davidian, you know, David Koresh cults and and all the, the strangest cults you can you can find today. Would they be the same type of people? Same type of people, exactly. A matter of fact, what happened was then after that. In, um, after Shabtai Tzvi died, one of the most powerful Sabadian cults, as they were called, was a transformation of the Dome, the most extreme cult, to Europe through a, an insidious person by the name of Yaakov Frank, Jacob Frank. He died in 1791. Now, the Frank has started to spread and take over entire communities and make them satanic. Matter of fact, no less uh, a personality than the Nobel Prize winner Isaac Bashev Singer describes how a community was corrupted in his Satan and Garay, which is based based on on very well documented history. So, one of the sources that I use is the late Professor Gershom Shalom, who wrote a lot about Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi, the mystical Messiah, is a very very thick book in Hebrew and in English, and goes through a lot of things. So, the to say that he was involved in conspiracy theories is ludicrous because he has documented studies. There are other professors also through Gershon Shalom that were involved with their students at the Hebrew University and still continuing the Sabadian studies as they're called because of the influence of this insidious group. And you can actually trace a line historically, which I do in my book to the CFR from Shabtai Tzvi and another organization called the Illuminati, which was founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt. 
and uh, they were involved also in the French Revolution, which was also well documented. So what you're saying is that there really does exist a new world order, that it's not a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy. Conspiracy And fact. you're a scientist, so you only deal with facts. You don't like to hear, you don't like to go on hearsay or on, uh, or on uh, jumping to conclusions, only fact. You've done research and you come to the conclusion uh, well, you haven't. You don't have to come to the conclusion. It's right there in front of you. Gather the facts to show that these are conspiracies that are going on in the world. There is indeed uh, people working in a new world order to try to make this, uh, to try to take over the world power. That's what you're saying. Right. And there, there are so many books on the, on the side of the of the Jewish philosopher that would be very ludicrous to to compare it, let's say, to the uh, protocols of the elders of Zion, the uh, which is which is uh, fiction. fiction. So uh, some of the professors at the time of Gershon Sholem was uh, Jacob Jacob uh, Katz. Professor Katz wrote a book called The Jews and Freemasonry, which gives a history of the interface between um, Jews and some of the cults that derived out of Shabtai Tzvi. But one, one of the, the next big cult that came from Shabtai Tzvi after the Dome organization, which was in Turkey, the next big cult were the Frankists, as I mentioned with Jacob Frank. So Jacob Frank, the Vat Arbor saw at the Council of Four Lands, wanted to deal with Frank, and they decided to have a, a big excommunication on the 20th of Sivan 250 years ago. And there they made the following rulings. They said everybody that is a Frankist is to be excommunicated. From the Jewish people. From the Jewish people. Bastards to the tenth generation is what it said, and uh, they prohibited people because the Frankists were into Kabbalah. They prohibited the study of Kabbalah until you were thirty or forty years old and you had a belly full, as they said, full of Talmud. Only then could you study the, the Kabbalah. Right. And uh, they said they're they're women or whores. The um, and they are hereby excommunicated from our people to the 10th generation. This is what the Council of, of uh, Four Lands, Four Lands at s labeled the Frankists right. because they so deviated from Judaism and all that Judaism holds to be true and righteous. These people went off and made their basically their own uh, deformed, deformed religion, and so the Jews wanted nothing to do with them. They kicked them out. That is correct. Okay. Now, studying the Frankist family trees, there was a family called the Bushka, which is like first cousin of Jacob Frank, in, Gershon Sholem spent six months in Paris at the National Library to ferret out things about the French Revolution, the connection with the Sabadians. So you can't dispute this material. There's a there's a direct line with with the uh, with the Jacobin Society and with the Illuminati. And Gershon Sholem writes concerning the Bushka. He he may have been. He said he was a member of the Illuminati but who is devoted to Sabadianism. Are there non-Jews that joined this Sabadian cult? No, no non-Jews did not join the Sabadian cult, but the non-Jews did join the, um, the Illuminati. And they worked together, and you're saying that these two, these two cults or organizations or, or whatever had planned and staged the French Revolution? Yes. They were involved in it, and, and Gershon Sholem proves it with the personality of the Bushka, who was who was uh, taken and, and he was beheaded on the guillotine because but wasn't of his involvement. The, wasn't the French Revolution ultimately, I mean, forget about the beheadings because that was horrible, but wasn't it ultimately good? I mean, democracy came from that. You got rid of this, uh, you know, spoiled upper royal class, and the people took over. Wasn't that a positive thing? There were positive and good things about it. The question is, let's start assessing it from a, a spiritual side. After the French Revolution, there was a descendancy in, of the reform and conservative movements. Interestingly enough, if you start studying the, who the leaders were of the conservative reform, you'll find a direct line to the Sabadian families in Europe of the Frankists. So they infiltrated back into Judaism and, and made these cut-off religions. They formed conservative and reformed Jewry. Right. Okay, because before that, there was only Torah observant Jews. You were a Jew, period. Right, and there was solidarity among all the Jews. After, after Shaphat Tzvi, you couldn't trust anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. Where is Shaphat Tzvi buried, by the way? He's buried in, the, in, um, in Albania. Do people go and visit his grave? And I understand they do. It's a Sufi shrine. It's a Sufi Shrine, Sufi which is, is Islam. Sufi is a is a Gnostic movement. 
in Islam, which seem to have been a tremendous influence on the Sabadian movement. And uh, the Sufi go all the way back in history, prior to even Islam. And uh, this business about virgins being a, a gift if you if you kill for Allah came from a Sufi from a particular Sufi cult, uh, which which uh, were were also Illuminati, according to one of the experts. Um, Spence, who who wrote a, an encyclopedia on the occult, claims that the uh, one of the Sufi cults were the assassins. Why are they called the assassins? Some hashish, the people would have have hashish, and Hassan ibn Saba, the old man of the mountain, had had a bunch of people that would assassinate people, and because they had hashish all the time. They were called assassins. So he equates the Illuminati with with this movement, the old, the old Illuminati prior prior to the 1776 organization of Illuminati. Now Hassan ibn Sabah, being the old man of the mountain as he was called, had a tremendous amount of influence in Islam, and uh, that that entire Sufi cult. The interesting thing is that he set up these places where they, they smoke hashashin, where luscious grounds, beautiful, luxurious places with lots of grass and flowers and fruits, and virgins. So this business about the virgin and the reward was done there by Hassan ibn Sabah. Oh, that's where they get their that's idea of heaven idea. from. Right. Huh. That, that's where that came from. Interesting. You know. But this is all in Spencer's Encyclopedia of the Occult. He himself, Spence, the author, was a Rosicrucian. That's, a, that's another Sufi group. I don't want to go into the Rose Cross. So that's where that came from. So you're saying that there are all these different organizations. Uh, one is the Sabbatian cults, which are Jews that were kicked out of Judaism. There's the Illuminati, which were not Jews. They were uh, Gentiles who had their own little secret uh, thing. You've got today Skull and Bones Society that we heard about with Yale University and President Bush and uh, many popular, I should say popular, but many famous politicians well, today. Professor Anthony Sutton wrote about that in depth, too. He was the one that I just quoted earlier as being the author of the uh, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, and Wall Street and the rise of Hitler. So Anthony Sutton has has written about that. He has a set, separate book out on that. Now I can tell you that in my in my two volumes, I start showing straight lines from the Illuminati and the Frankists, the Haskalah movement, the Jacobin Society, the Reform movement, and different years that initiatives had. The Illuminati were involved to destroy the Bible and biblical authority and to help promote <coughs> biblical criticism in the university level. You know what, let me stop you here because we have to take a break for the news and then you can go over and explain this all to us, how everything adds up today and where we are today in, in world politics and, and policies and agendas and who's running things. So Rabbi Antman, what you're saying is, is that a lot of this started with a cult of people who thought that Shabtai Tzvi, who lived in the uh, 16th century? Or the 17th, 17th century, 17th century. 1626, 1676. <laughs> okay, he claimed that he was the um, Messiah. Uh, in the end, he got so many followers that he was a threat to the kingdom. So the sultan said either convert or die. He was jailed. He was put in prison. He chose to convert to Islam, lost a lot of followers, but there's still some hardcore members. And they took uh, what he was teaching and they perverted it even more. And they decided that in order to bring the Messiah, we have to uh, have everybody sin so the world gets to such a low level, God has to come in and save us. That's basically what their philosophy was? Yes, but they also considered Shabtai Tzvi to be God. To be God? Yes. <laughs> okay, we're really doing with sicko. So this council mm -hmm. of the four lands, these ra rabbis, said anybody who has anything to do with us, uh, Shabtai Tzvi, who believes uh, who is a Sabbatian, or Sabadian, who is uh, a Frankist when that came later. These people are excommunicated from, from Judaism. They have nothing to do with us. We do not um, uh, 
believe in this stuff and it's not Jewish and, and they've chose to give up their Jewishness. I want to mention that the Frankists were in existence already when the uh, Council of Four Lands came up with this edict because Jacob Frank was causing all kinds of problems in Europe at the time. He died in 1791 and he made an offensive into uh, Eastern Europe and, and what today is Moldavia or Bessarabia. Moldavia? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he he had his cult very, very strong there. And uh, so he was operating from 1753 already with initiatives three years before they came out with the pr pronouncement against the Sabadian Frankists. All right. And at the same time, there were other organizations of people getting together who were not Jewish, Gentiles and the, the Illuminati, who had their own plans to try to get world dominion or as much, at least as much power as they could. And today, everything seems to be coming together. You see different blocks being formed in the world. You've got the European Union. It looks like there could be now a North American Union tying Mexico, America, the USA, and, and Canada uh, into one North American Union. It looks like there's going to be probably an African block a Latin American block, a uh, Asian block, and of course Shimon Peres back when, when he brought us Oslo was talking about a new Middle East, which would, which would be a Middle Eastern block, and and yet these people still exist today. You're saying from these. I'm just going to jump ahead just for a minute because I want to tie it in for today, so it's relevant. These groups of people who are still trying to make their one world agendas to gain power and strength and money and 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 everything that they're they're vying for here they are trying to do this so they can have power um, who are these people you said that's the CFR are there any other groups just like you had the Illuminati who were in Europe are, is there a, is there a European based type of Council of Foreign Relations, CFR, think tanks that are guiding governments and infiltrating into different movements to, to steer people to go one way There's or another? There's the Bilderberg Group in Europe. There, there are a lot of groups that run in tandem. Are they Jewish, the Bilderbergs? No, absolutely not. The thing is, though, the genius of the Arbor thought the Council of Four Lands, was to put a Gentile label on any Jew that started to get involved in these derivative organizations. So it's out, out of the fold completely. So these the people... Page. So any, any Jew that gets involved in the conspiracies comes out of Judaism. The fact of the matter is that... the least Judaism, in other words. They've right. left uh, they, all they've of our values. It. As a uh -huh. matter of fact, uh, it was even reiterated at the time of Trotsky. Trotsky uh, was excommunicated as a Jew and the, the followers of the Bolsheviks in... Uh, in a tribunal separately meeting in the Ukraine at the, at the time of, uh, of the Bolshevik Revolution. So are there still Sabadians today? Yes. It's interesting that you, you should mention this because if I, I wrote Volume 1 in 1974, and uh, one history professor, which I bring down in my book, said as follows. He said that I took a quantum leap from Shabtai Tzvi to communism without any basis in fact, and I posited the continued existence of Sabadians. And he was skeptical over my assertion that some groups continued to enforce their secrecy after over 300 years and considered the notion absurd. But now he's changed his tune because there was one guy who was a member of the Dormes secretly, whose name is Ilga Zorlu, who wrote a book that was published in 1999 called Yes, I Am a Salonican. And there was a feature story that appeared in Jerusalem Report in 1999 on the book. Among the revelations was that no Sabadian, with the exception of Vilga Zorlu himself, will ever publicly admit to being one. After centuries of secrecy and denial, Zorlu is determined to break the silence, to put the issue on the public agenda, and to prove that the Sabadians are actually crypto-Jews and that their Muslim appearances are nothing more than a sham. Ilgaz is like a missionary. He wants to spread the work of Sabadianism. Some scholars say the Sabadians of Istanbul continue to practice many other of their own peculiar rituals. Sabadian married couples gather to eat spring's duly born lamb for the first time after the meal. The lights go out and couples have sex without distinguishing between their partners. So he mentioned all this stuff, and he mentioned in his book that the Sabadian cemetery there's a tomb of a Supreme Court judge, for example, who lies next to the ex-leader of the Communist Party. So once his book came out, people stopped saying those things about me. Because here's a member of the cult exposing it.
do, do they have some type of special power that they're so successful, the people in these cults? No, well, it's, it's no different than the power. Let's say you have a group of Freemasons who give each other business or business people that join the Rotary or something so like that. So it's just a click. It's a click. And because they help each yeah, other, right. they're able to uh, put themselves up higher and higher. Yes. Out of, out of the Domek came a lesser personality than Ataturk, who, who was a, the first leader of the new, new Turkey, a secular government Turkey you have today. The switch from Istanbul to Anatolia. He was a member of the Dome historically. All right, why don't we go to some callers? We have joining us now from the virtual studio, we have Esther from New York. Esther, what's your comment or question for us here at Israel National Radio? Do we have Esther from New York from the virtual studio? I have a question for Dr. Andelman. Um, I thought I understood him to say a few minutes ago that the Sabbateans were connected with the foundation of reform and conservative Judaism. Um, I would be interested in hearing a little bit more information about that or some uh, clarification. Okay. Thanks. I'd be happy to do that. The, uh, my basis for this is, first of all, Gershon Sholem's writings. There's one particular uh, article which was very, very popular called The uh, Holiness of Sin, which appeared in commentary, uh, which is based on the idea of mitzvah haba ba'avera, a mitzvah that's derived through a sin, like uh, taking a stolen etrog and using it to make a bracha. The Gershon Sholem is the one that, that did the research, and he points out that the leaders of the, of the reform movement were from the big, basic Sabadian families. In his book, The Messianic Idea in Judaism, for example, he has a chapter where he visits the Brandeis family. And Brandeis family came from Sabadians. There's a Brandeis mm -hmm. University. That's right. Um, anyhow, Dembitz, which was also part of that family, was also a Sabadian family, but Dembitz renounced their Sabadianism in front of the Beddin. Uh, in any event, he shows that the will of family and other families were identical with those families that started the conservative reform movement. The reform movement was started in 1845 by Zachariah Frankel. And, and if you look at his family tree, you'll see that his family came from the Wheel of Family, which is the Sabadian Frankist family. I discuss these families in, in great detail in Eliminate the Opiate Volume 2. Do you have footnotes in your book so people can... Oh, yes. They, they, can, check, they can check it all out and uh, trace it all. I have a chapter dealing with Solomon Schechter, which I call Solomon Shecker because of the disinformation. Shecker means <laughs> lie in Hebrew. Right, which, where I go into great detail about what the conservative movement is all about, how they, they reject uh, Torah and Shemayim, divine revelation of the Torah, and other things. Now today, the latest that I've heard on the subject is that the Jewish Theological Seminary of America is getting a new leader, and he wants to see a lot of a lot of the clergy in the, in the conservative movement replaced by people who are lesbians and homosexuals. Uh, let me just jump in here for a minute. It seems to me that uh, so you're basically saying that these these families who are in who are in this cult, the, the Sabadians, have infiltrated into Judaism. They split Judaism. They made a reform Judaism. They made another, another uh, conservative uh, Judaism to split the Jewish people. And I think that uh, somebody was saying that now they've even infiltrated into Yeshiva University uh, with uh, what was I just don't have the name at the top of my tongue. I'm sure David knows, but what's his name? From Yeshiva University, they just appointed him the head now. Do you uh -huh. know what I'm talking about, David? David, you can help me on this. Don't you remember we were talking about that? No one's helping me here. All right, when, when you remember, let me know. So basically, they're infiltrating. And let me just read something that you wrote in your book in the in the 70s here. You wrote here, and this is very. This is very, I, I can't believe you wrote this in the 70s, because we, we're only talking about this today, maybe the earliest in the 90s, about being politically correct. You wrote here, abortion has been converted from fetal murder to a right to choose. Homosexuality has been uh, turned from a sexual perversion to a sexual preference. 
assisted suicide from a from a felony has been changed to a right to determine one's future. Sexual restraint from uh, an expression of human dignity has been turned into an a uh, anachronism. Uh, th basically, they were making all of these things that the world has held as immoral, making it acceptable. They're already turning people's minds and manipulating people to say that, no, these things are okay. It's not, it's not that you're uh, a homosexual and you're doing an abominable act. It's just an alternate lifestyle, a, a different lifestyle choice. They're, they're rewording things. They're putting cosmetics on all these things. And this is the way that they can get people to think and do what they want them to do. Let's go to another caller. We have joining us from Baltimore. We have William. William, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tamar. Shalom Aleichem, Rabbi. Um, I had a two-part question. Um, how can we see the influence of uh, these groups in CFR and the others in the government and administration of Israel today? And two, uh, we're talking about some very uh, far-reaching and powerful people. Um, what can the average person, religious Jew, uh, in my case, B'nai Noach, do uh, in their individual lives about this without being in a position of power to, uh, to make any kind of uh, important decisions? And our Shmon for every day we pray for the uh, coming back and the redemption of the Gula, the redemption. And uh, if we believe this, especially if we, we can pick ourselves up and come to Israel and live, it will be the beginning of the Tchalta de Gula, the beginning of the redemption, which I believe events that have unfolded in the last years seem to show that God is, has a moving finger. But if we start supporting those people that have other ideas that want to see Chas Shalom, the destruction of Gula, then we're the redemption, then we're in trouble. The um, so do your thing, be observant, and be knowledgeable. Like you're listening to to Arut Sheva, which is very very good. And uh, as we all come together, Jews from all over the world, God will bring us to the ultimate redemption. All right, so basically you're calling for Aliyah. Strong call there for Aliyah. Let's go now to Washington, D.C. We have joining us Tom. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Dr. Marvin Antelman. What evidence do you have that many of the Jews, uh, if, if any that is, uh, that many of the Jews in the neoconservative movement here in the United States are false, disingenuous, or Sabbatean Jews, either knowingly or unknowingly, and that the neocons may have an entirely different agenda than most people would imagine? Uh, I have not studied the neocons. I'm familiar with the neocons, and I, I have at this particular point in time, I have nothing to say on the subject. All right. Do people in a conservative movement know the roots of their beliefs that this is Sabadian? Do they Are they secret Sabadians? And you know, when you talk about neocons, I, I saw the gentleman was talking about politically neocons, not the, not, not, not the conservative movement oh, of, the, hung up. Of, okay. of Solomon Shecker. Okay, Solomon Shecker. All right, again, 1-800-270-4288. We only have about eight minutes left to the show, so if you want to call with a comment or question, um, if you want to talk to one of the smartest men in the world, you can do that right now, 1-800-270-4288. So we have, so we, we've, we've uh, covered basically the roots of these different organizations. You said, again, there's the Illuminati that was from Europe, and they were not Jewish. They've got this broken-off cult of people who left Judaism and uh, became Sab Sabadians, and that's what uh, uh, a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, uh, today about the New World Order. You had something on one of your uh, – on, on one website where you were talking about the dollar bill and the sim symbols on the dollar bill of the, of the Illuminati who are not Jewish, the pyramid and the eye, all seeing God. What can you tell us about that? Yes, there's a fellow by the name of Spencer many years ago came out with a book called The Cult of the All-Seeing Eye. Uh, interesting enough, the Illuminati had a symbol, and that was an eye on top of a pyramid, which came from the Avodah Zara, the paganism of uh, ancient Egypt, like Horus, and we, we ourselves have uh, Baal Peor. We're coming up soon with Parshat Bullock about Bilam, who's referred to as Shtuma Ayin, which they, which they say was blind, but Shtuma Ayin, in my opinion, was... He was the uh, the cult master of the all-seeing eye in his day. 
So this is an ancient symbol that came that came and is associated with the Illuminati. What's with the Jesuit priests or the Jesuits or something? Uh, here's what it is. Weishaupt himself was at Ingolstadt University, which was a Jesuit college. So the Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati, was founded in Ingolstadt, which was which was run and dominated by the Jesuits. Some people say that Weiss had himself was a Jesuit, but apparently it seems anything I could find that was substantive, that that was substantive as far as docu documentation was concerned, shows that he was involved with the Jesuits, but he himself was not a Jesuit. So we've got the Jesuits, we've got the Illuminati, we've got the Sabadians. What about the the Pope, the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, the uh, Church I'll, of Rome? Uh, they're still doing their old thing, <laughs> but uh, as far as uh, the Illuminati itself is, were concerned. Um, the anti-Semites have taken over the Illuminati as part of the Jewish conspiracy and domination, and, and they're writing about the protocols, so they lump us all together. But some of them even say the White, White Hat was Jewish. And unfortunately, there's some people who who take that stuff and they regurgitate it back to us and, t and take it as a fact. Whatever White Hat was. He wasn't Jewish, but even if he were, he would have been automatically excommunicated by the Vadar Baratzot. The genius of Vadar Baratzot meant that any, any Jew or a, Jew, a person of Jewish origin, his Jewish origin was null and void. He was outside of the pale if he got involved with these things. Like we have in the in Sanhedrin, for example, in Perik Chelik, the Elushe Englehem Chelik, but these people do not have a share the world could come and they list. He doesn't believe in the, that the Torah was revealed by God, etc. So we have our list of heresies that go all the way back, and the Vada Baratso was only building on those heresies. So the Council of Foreign Relations, which is a think tank, they basically uh, come together. It's an invitation-only uh, type of group. You can, nobody, not, uh, nobody off the street can join them. No, you're, you're right. And if you want to read more about them, uh, there are a lot of books out on the subject, but as far as authoritative books, I, I would say that the two professors that I mentioned, Quigley's books are available, uh, Tragedy and Hope, and the, uh, the Anglo-American Establishment, and Anthony Sutton's two books on the Bolshevik Revolution and the Rise of Hitler, and, the Bolshe and uh, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, and Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution are there if anybody wants to do documentary studies. So now the CFR is one think tank that uh, you would say is trying to uh, m get world dominance. They want the world to go a certain way. They're making, they're helping to make these blocks. As I said in another show, they're helping to make this, New Europe, uh, this North American Union by the year 2010. Who is involved today in the CFR that we need to worry about? Who is, who, who is in the Jewish world and in the American world today that is infiltrating into politics in these countries and these nations who want to see uh, these nations weakened and, and destroyed? Who do we have to worry about? Well, there's a whole list of them. You have to get, get the list, <laughs> which you can get uh, on, on the Internet. The, uh, do we have to worry about Bush, Clinton? Bush's father was a member of the CFR. Bush himself is not a member of the CFR. Uh, but just about every, the founder of the CFR was Colonel Edward House. And the CFR was incorporated in 1921, and he founded in Versailles in 1918, and he, there's a British counterpart. So in the Anglo-American establishment, which was written by Anthony Sutton, he goes to great lengths to show then that the Arabs are a favorite party of the, of the CFR. And so we have to, how dangerous are they? Very dangerous. They want nothing more than complete domination of the world and the restoration of Plato's Republic. They, they conceive of themselves as the, the priestly and the and the ruling class of Plato's Republic, and they, they want to bring this new world society. Um, do they think that they're doing this altruistically? That they're really good, or do they know that they're evil and they just want to? They're just ambitious businessmen who want to. They don't care about everybody, anybody else. They just want to have riches and power, and that's it. I don't believe it. They're monolithic. You have different personalities, and they all have their own way of locking in. Some consider themselves satanic. There are other groups that interface with them, like the Bohemian Grove, which is pagan satanic. So you're saying some of these people actually are what some people say that they're in these devil cults, the skull and bones, and that. Or they belong to the Sufi and and uh, Hastings. Encyclopedia of uh, Ethics and Religion goes into great detail into the Sufi and its satanic uh, theology. There's been some claims that some of these people in the CFR and and in these uh, you know elite groups uh, that practice 
devil worship, uh, black magic, that they really are gaining dark powers, and that's why they are so successful. Would you agree with that, or you say it's hogwash? I don't believe in dark powers. <laughs> the, uh, however, you have nothing, nothing less than the United Nations itself having a meditation room, which is Sufi and Avodah Zarah, pagan in every sense of the word. In the UN? At the in United Nations in the, in the meditation room, the United Nations. And matter of fact, Spencer's book, Code of the Old Sea Night, discusses it. I don't believe that we got to the end of the show. It was fast, right? I want to thank you so much for being with us.